report with the national think tank Demos. It's called The Great Cost Shift. It's on our website if you guys are interested. I didn't have any copies that I could quickly grab before I had to leave the office today and I've had a crazy day, but um, it's on onewiscontinow.org. The Great Cost Shift, it's basically looking at what has state disinvestment done to the state of Wisconsin? You know, what does that mean for the student debt crisis? What does that mean for our state's economy? Um, and it, it's not just in the last, you know, couple years, it's like, you know, the last couple decades. So it's, it's, it's been going on for a while, unfortunately. I mean, this, this crisis has been building essentially since Ronald Reagan was in office. So this divestiture in, in the infrastructure is, you know, those speaks to education too. And um, I, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen to you, Rob, here in town. You know, you can only constrict it so much, and then um, yeah. something something has to give. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that bothers me is the students really don't understand interest, right? You know. So if you've got a high interest rate, you're going to end up paying, you know, uh, as much for interest as you paid for your, your original loan, you know? And you spend years just trying to get to the point where you can pay yeah, on the principal. Yep. <clears throat> and, and, and that's spelled out in here, that they have, to have, they have to have more knowledge about what they're getting into. But in the defense of the students that did take some of those loans, they were only especially in when the economy took a tank, they were only, they were doing what everybody told them they needed to do. If the only people that came out ahead after the recessions were those with college degrees. Everybody else has been, and that's part of the problem too, is we haven't seen wages grow. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all the things that should have happened have not been happening, especially in Wisconsin. Our, our wages are not growing, so any amount of debt becomes a larger amount of debt. Yeah. So there's just so many things that have compounded to make this just a horrible situation or a crisis, as Annalise said. So yeah, and I think one of the things that keeps coming up that kept coming up at the we had, there was a hearing on this bill last week, um, and I was telling Deb there were 22 people who spoke in favor of this legislation. There were three people who spoke for information only, meaning they either weren't they weren't for it or they weren't against it. They were just there to provide some information, and there were what did I say 30. 30 some people who registered in favor of it. No one registered or spoke against this bill. No one. That's rare. And Usually this, there's at least one person. <laughs> and this is not a bill that, you know, as opposed to a Republican bill that is, can't be amended because they won't let you. We would love somebody to put an amendment on this and pass it. But, um, you know, I'm sure there are other ideas that would work just give it to us and let's discuss it. Yeah. If you don't think the structure for refinancing the loans will work, let's figure out a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the parts where you, just, you know, don't put more mandates on the colleges, well, this is something that they have to do. You have to tell them what the cost of going to your institution. We're past that point. You need to tell the students what it's gonna to cost to go to your institution. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, but one of the, before I get to your question, the, one of the, the big themes was, you know, what are you doing for me as legislators to make me want to stay here after I graduate? I mean, we are, we have already have brain drain. You know, doing this could, you know, keep some of us here. I mean, a lot of folks that I graduated with, they're either in Minnesota or California because that's where, you know, jobs are. That's where wages are. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of folks who are from here who want to stay here, but we're not giving them any options. And it's, you know, folks who want to start businesses. Um, the student debt is killing entrepreneurship. Um, you know, particularly, you know, here where we could use that. Um, it's also hurting farmers. There's a lot of farmers who go and, you know, take an agricultural class or two or get, you know, short programs, two-year programs and they're stuck with debt. And how are you supposed to run your family farm or invest in equipment or land if you have this debt with this interest rate that you can no longer, you know, they look at that and they say, well, why should I give you a loan for your farm <laughs> if you have this? So it's this, you know, it's not just, you know, folks coming out of, you know, liberal arts colleges. I mean, we did our research also on our website, you know, it hurts tech college kids, it hurts 
you know, folks who come out of our two years um, with associates, and then it, it gets even worse if you have advanced degrees. I mean, we're losing family doctors. Uh, we're losing doctors and dentists who would, you know, potentially work in rural areas because guess what? They're working where money is and they're specializing. I have a friend in med, in med school at Northwestern. She wants to come back here to Wisconsin when she's done and do family medicine. She says the majority of her class, they're specializing because they'll make more money so that they can pay off their loans. So we're going to have this whole need, and we have this need, you know, for general practitioner doctors, and we can't meet it because we're not giving them options on the other end. Um, I'm looking at this from another angle too. Talk about it of education, I think sometimes we have people at the top of universities and want to build these big universities. And I can think of a situation when I'm in Missoula, we had this millionaire couple that came along and said, oh, we'll build you and we'll give you a million dollars and you go build a new business administration building on campus. So they built a $12 million building with the $1 million named it after the Gallagher's. Well, that other $11 million had to come from somewhere. They didn't need a new business anymore. And they, and they, they have their all these big fancy facilities that costs the students. Mm -hmm. And yet, you look at the, the payment of the professors on those campuses, and the University of Montana practically runs the whole campus on adjunct professors. Yeah. I mean, I knew a woman that worked there for over 20 years, she was an adjunct professor. They're not spending the money on the professors and the students, it's the facilities. So we have this beautiful campus with all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know how necessary. That well, and I'm sure that's yeah, right. That's what I said. I, I'm, I'm not going to second guess that some universities could tighten their belt. I'm just saying there's also been a cascade of things that have affected the universities that oh, were I not. Agree with everything you, you said, yeah. I agree with everything you guys are saying, but I'm just saying there's this other thing too that, mm -hmm. that I think needs to be looked at too. Yeah, and to everything you're saying. so what's interesting about that, and, and I, I absolutely agree with you, but you know, what didn't happen is universities didn't continue maintenance on their buildings, and so there is, on some campuses, very much a need for new buildings. I mean, some of them not so much, but some of them absolutely yes. My little brother, my youngest brother, is a senior at UW-Eau Claire. Um, his first year, he was not in a real dorm room because they don't have the money to build another dorm at UW-Eau Claire because the state keeps cutting funds. And so his dorm, his very first year, while my other brother and I had like real dorm rooms, um, was what used to be the lounge on the floor. And it was him and four other guys living there. His girlfriend at the time lived in the hotel that the University of Eau Claire pays for because they cannot afford to build a new dormitory. And I think you know the other part of you know the need for new infrastructure and facilities comes out of the, just the sheer number of people who are attending college, and some colleges don't have the space. Some do, some absolutely don't. Um, you know, do they need to be large and fancy? No, but there are buildings on campuses that are crumbling that are dangerous for students. I mean, I there was a lecture hall in UW Madison Humanities Building. I love it. But sometimes it rained in the classroom. <laughs> and so, you know, there there is, you know, some need for that. And when, you know, your state is continually cutting the money that could normally go pay for to go pay for those things, you know, that money does have to come from somewhere. And a lot of the choice projects, um, I think rebuilding the Memorial Union um, or renovating it at UW Madison, students voted for that. Um, they're, you know, because it was a segregation, a segregated fee increase on a lot of campuses. You know, students will vote whether or not to pay for things. Unfortunately, you know that often means students coming after them are paying for things. Um, but you know that that is a part of it. And you know, I think that there's, you know, in addition to that, there's just the general cost of college. Um, you know, of what that stuff is going to pay for. I mean, it's. I would love to see you know debt free college. Um, but I think we're, I mean, it's, it's there. We're a little far off from it, but, and there are a bunch of amazing people who are working on that. Um, but my organization, are, we're 100% focused on the, you know, existing, you know, $1.3 trillion in debt and what in God's name are we gonna do about that before it becomes like this next crazy bubble. Mm -hmm.
You know, when I was on school board here, we had, so the legislature, last biennium, got in an uproar because Madison, because the university system had this, what they call the slush fund or whatever. But when we were on the school board here in, in Janesville, we set in policy that we should carry a 17% fund balance, 17% of our budget. So on a budget of $100 million, or $100 million, you would have $17 million in a fund balance so that you could pay, so that you would never have short-term borrowing because all education comes in spurts and you didn't want to have to, you know, you get this amount of revenue in October and then this amount in January or February and this amount in July. You didn't ever want to have to do short-term borrowing. So when I talked to Ray Cross right after they crashed down on the university and said you have way too much in your general fund. Which was on par with other university systems. Actually, it was, I think it was less than 1%. And I thought, <laughs> what could you possibly, how can you possibly only have, when, we, when I ran my husband's medical clinic, we had a significant fund balance because I didn't want, or in, in, well, I also run a farm. I don't want to have to do short-term borrowing. That is not an efficient way to run a business. Mm -hmm. And they froze tuition and told them to spend down the fund balance. And I'm thinking that is so short-sighted. Mm -hmm. They have no cushion. I'm sure they're having to do you know some short-term borrowing because they have such sporadic and defined periods of time for you know, income. So it was, in my opinion, it was very short-sighted. I mean, if you want to freeze tuition for a while, if for a postcard, that's fine, but you cannot do it for four years, five years, six years, and it is, it, it's going to, it's going to cause, it's going to create breath havoc when they try to come out of this. Tuition was frozen once before within, <coughs> for the four-year colleges um, at UW system, and um, the two years after had double-digit tuition increases, um, which, you know, was, you know, just awful. Um, and, you know, I also think it's funny that um, the four-year, the two-year colleges, they did have tuition frozen during the recession with the number of folks who were going back to school in need of, you know, job retraining, you know, new training, whatever. Um, so they had their tuition frozen, and when Governor Walker came in, his first budget, he was like, no, we're not keeping that freeze. And so he unfroze their tuition and jacked it 5.5%. Um, just like he did with all the schools. And then he realized in the second budget when he was like, oh, I want to run for governor and then I want to run for president and I'm going to freeze tuition. So he actually freezed <coughs> tuition before he froze it. <laughs> but he doesn't like to mention that fact. <laughs> yes. All the discussion has been relative to student debt. Mm -hmm. I think it bears pointing out that students in Europe do not have debt because education is paid for. In Germany, they even pay uh, living expenses for the students. And what we really need to be talking about here, Bernie Sanders at least mentioned it last night, is that higher education, at least uh, in the public school sector, ought to be free. Yeah. And it's every other civilized country, uh, it is. While you're on the subject, then go on to medicine while you're at it. I mean, how are they doing that? So that people would be like, wow, what are we just taking it? Uh, taxes or for you, the you know, how college. they do that? Like, you know, <coughs> places where they, well, they, they, they pay a lot. They pay a lot more. It's, so yeah. that's it, you got the evil word. But, yeah. evil word but your, but your health care is free. Tax the millionaire. Yeah. 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 You know, I know, but I'm just saying that yeah. how you can position that to so and, and more didn't. people won't be like, oh, it, look out. Well, out. and it, it's a tax issue, but it's also a values issue. Yeah. Yes. I mean, right. they oh, value yeah. that that education, and they say, well, we want a productive society. We want productive <laughs> citizens. We're going to invest in you. Um, you know, there's the... This thing on um, Facebook that I saw going around, it broke down different countries and it was like, oh, I want to go to college. And it was like, you know, I think Germany was like, cool, we'll pay for it. This country, we'll pay for it. United States, uh, no, you need to pay for that yourself and we expect you 
you know, to figure that out. <laughs> and then you're going to add to these coffers of the United States while you're doing yeah. it. Yeah, and it's really, I mean, it's right. really, it's really a values issue. And I think that we used to, um, you know, we used to value it a little bit more. Um, and we have gotten away from that in the last 30 years. And that's, you know, sort of where we're at. And so I think these, you know, the debt-free college proposals are amazing and fantastic. And I think the number of people who would benefit from that would be, you know, just, it would be wonderful, um, you know, what we could do with that. But, you know, at the same time, as someone who's already gone through college, you know, who, you know, potentially looks at grad schools and then is like, mm, I can't afford that, you know, with the debt, I can't afford more debt. Um, you know, I I want to also figure out how we're dealing with this one point three trillion dollars in the back kind of question. Well, just like this gentleman over here said his tuition was like sixty eight dollars, whatever a year. I went to school in Chicago in uh, northeastern Illinois University and my tuition it was called a service fee. Yeah. Was sixty eight dollars and then I paid for my books. And I true it was probably 45 years ago, but it was like, what happened? Yeah. Yeah. I know they're paying tuition now too for going, you know, it's, it's a commuter school, but it was like, what happened to those values? I, you know, I, I don't know. Wait, we just, the state just decided to, the, the state. That, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't fun. We were being put in, we were becoming teachers to go into the Chicago. Yeah. yeah. And so after that shifted, I don't know. Yeah. Here and then here. Um, you two can decide which one's going first. Yeah. That would be no. No. Janet. this off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Five brownies. <laughs> Are you Did you make them? <laughs> Did you make them or did you? She made them. Oh. <laughs> she can go first. Um. <laughs> I have, I have a couple things to say, and one is that my son went to law school, and um, he's not practicing law. He's a teacher in, in the white school system, a very difficult system to work in. He says that he will probably never be done paying off his student loans. And the other thing, <clears throat> the other thing I have to say is uh, you mentioned how it, it's our duty to buy new cars, or at least we have that sense of we're helping the economy if we buy a new mm -hmm. car. How come if I buy a car, which I just did in last January, I, I'm paying, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm paying less than 3% interest on a, a product that will deteriorate over time, um, but students are paying six whatever percent interest on an education which is invaluable, mm -hmm. not only to themselves, but to their society. Yep. Who's making that money? Who's deciding students should pay that kind of interest rate? Who's making the money? What's the, well, what's uh, the value there? Yeah, well part of it is, um, and I think Deb touched on this a little bit, is the collateral issue. So if you, you know, can't pay your car, they're gonna take your car from you. And um, you can get the low interest rate because they know you're gonna make that thing and that there's, there's an option for them. They can take something. They can't take your diploma. You know, you're gonna have that. Um, and if you are, you know, 18, 19, going to college, you probably don't have any assets. I did not. I still have very few. Um, so, so that is the problem. It just, it can't be collateralized. Yeah. But it also can't be, dis it's not dischargeable. So there's an asset there that a lot of other debt doesn't have. Right. So. And the way that this came about was because, so in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, um, Wall Street was like, oh, we can make so much money off of this. Um, and that's when they deregulated, you know, essentially the, the student loan industry and took away all of our consumer protection. Uh, I have a timeline, actually, I should have brought it. Um, it's, there were a number of things in the, in the 1990s and then also in the, in the 2000s um, that just completely obliterated any options that you had um, as a student loan borrower. And, and all sorts of people. I mean, I worked in a bank in Colby, Kansas, and you know, we, we service some student debts. Everybody's making money off. It's not just the institution that sold the debt in the first place. It's yeah. the people that are servicing, and then they can sell those yeah. debts to yeah. other people. Yeah. And everybody's, right. everybody's making a lot of money. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and, the, and, you know, how do they decide those rates? I think was a question that you had. Yeah. Um, they just pick. 
<laughs> um, they, so they actually, there was legislation that they got the, the last time they were looking at doubling the interest rate, which was two About years doubling? ago? Oh yeah, it doubled. It went from 3.4 to 6.8. Um, they decided, well, instead of, a lot, they, they allowed it to double, and then they walked back on that and said... Who's they? The Congress. The fe okay. federal government. Sorry. Um, and they said, okay, well, let's tie it to something. And so that's why they were able to offer this year's, this year's loans at 4.3%. So now it's like a variable rate that's tied to the market. Um, so it could be 11 one year, and then it could go back down to two, and you either get lucky or you don't on what years you need loans. Well, the, the other factor is, you know, before the student actually takes out a loan, you know, so the state has decreased their support, mm -hmm. um, but you have all these other things like uh, publishers, you can freeze tuition, publishers keep it raising their prices, uh, and they also dictate mandates about education. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then we have mandates that are government mandates that are costing administrative money. Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, so you have the underpaid faculty, and then you have the increased pay and existence of administrators. You have so many factors that are, and, and I would just call it the corporatization of education. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you, how do you, you know, until we get the solutions from Sanders or other people, how do we, you know, fight that? So that in the, the loan in the first place isn't taken out. Yeah. I got nothing at this point. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like the. When we tackle that one, then we can tell, t tackle the corporatization of all of government. Yeah. You know? I mean, the it's fact just that we're 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 beholding, beholden yeah. to all of the, yeah. all the corporations. And now, do you want to turn to campaign finance that we're going to go through next week? Right. Uh, or the GAB? Yeah. yeah. And I think you know, and, and to that, I think you know, with the budget cuts that have happened with the UW system. Like, they have cut everything that they can. And, you know, it just, they've gotten to the point where they have so many students and so many things that they need, you know, to be doing and to make the university run that, like, they're operating, you know, bare bones and they're getting to the point where, you know, they're going to need to cut. And so I think a lot of that comes from the fact that we freeze tuition and also, you know, cut so much money. And I still contend you cannot take away a general fund an operating fund of a big institution right. that has sporadic mm -hmm. income and not suffer the consequences. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. So if those interest rates change, if you get a, your student loans come like with every quarter, right? Um, every semester, you guys have a semester? Yes, yes. Semester. but so they usually they usually do it per academic year. Okay, so you could have four loans at four different interest rates? Correct. Mm -hmm. Right, and do they bundle that somehow? When you get out, so. Um, so it depends. Um, for example, I have two loans. They're both at 6.8%. Um, I have the option of consolidating those loans. Um, and what happens if you have loans at different interest rates and you consolidate them, you don't get to pick the lowest interest rate. <laughs> they take an average of it. They average them. Um, and so, and the also other fun fact about that is you can only consolidate your loans once. Um, and to get that rate. So that's federally, right? Yep, federally. Aaron? Yeah, um, we were talking about values and, and, and where European values are much you know, more for common good. And well. well, they used to be our values. Well, that's true. I, I'm not saying <laughs> that. But we, we, look, we value you know, entertainment and sports. Now, we got a question like, we got college football. Apparently, there is a, a new doc, a very short documentary about called College Football Stealing Your Education. I mean, we spend apparently seven times more on athletes for the whole general of bigger colleges than we do on the average students. Yeah. Uh, coaches have very enormous salaries. Mm -hmm. And I, from what I read, 20 to 30 colleges are actually making any income off of the actual oh, yeah. team. So, I mean, 
we talked about ways to look. I mean, to me, right there, we're, we seem to be valuing something yeah. there more so than others. Well, and but what, what a lot of those colleges do is that they spin off their athletic departments. Yeah, and so their athletic departments are not tied to <clears throat> the university. So it's the University of Wisconsin Madison and then the University of Wisconsin Madison Athletic Department. Department. So they they're they're yes. self sustaining, although they make yep. money and they should be giving money. Oh, mm -hmm. yep. so, um, but there are a couple of campuses um, that um, their athletic departments are tied to their university. They're not spun off, which is why the UW Oshkosh men's soccer team that has gone to nationals, you know, year after year, um, is at danger of being cut um, because of the budget cuts because that kind of stuff is in part funded by the university. So the ones that make money are the ones that are spun off. And they don't want to give it back to the university. No. Well, who, who, who enables that spinning off? Who says, oh, that's a great idea? I actually don't know. Um, I think they, um, I think it's kind of how they did UW Hospital back in the day, because it also used to be a part of the, um, the, the school. And they spun it off with a board <laughs> and a whole new thing. It's, there's a lot of procedure and things that I just don't know about. I would think for the most it. part, spinning a, an athletic department off would make sense, you know, for smaller college. I mean, you know, depending on how success, I'm assuming back in the day, the University of Wisconsin football did not generate a lot of dollars, but it does now. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to guess more often than not, it kind of made sense. So it would be as you know, they'd say, well, let's spin it off and then you pay for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Well, there should be a provision in there. They should think ahead that says, but when you start to make money, we want that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, and what's, what's interesting, though, yeah. is that um, the, so the money that they do make off of that, they, um, a lot of it does go to scholarships. And so they pay for the student athletes to attend school, but not for your non-athlete students. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>